Well, thank you all for joining. My name is Mike Bass. I'm a product manager here at Meetup. Welcome to Meetup Live. Uh, today, we're joined by special guest Pamela Paul. Pamela is the editor of the New York Times Book Review and author of her new book, which we'll be talking quite a bit about, is 100 Things We've Lost to the Internet, where she shares powerful insights into both the profound and the seemingly trivial things we've lost from punctuation to vacation postcards. She'll dig deeper into the larger repercussions of our digital lives, including memory or feelings of blissfulness uh, brought by the endless scrolling like we're doing through this Zoom chat and the utter destruction of privacy. But, uh, but all that sounds kind of disparaging, but we're gonna share some advice for reclaiming a bit of the real world and lessons on fostering uh, connection and community. So again, th thank you all for, for joining today. Okay, just before we get started, we're gonna go over a few guidelines and the agenda. If we go over to the next slide, yay. So just so you know, this event will be recorded, but don't worry, you're not gonna appear on the video and your audio will be muted. So you're only gonna hear Pamela and I. Uh -huh. The chat for the event will be turned off, but if you have any questions, submit them through the Q&A feature on the bottom of the Zoom screen. Um, we also have closed captioning available. At the bottom of the screen, you'll see the live transcript icon and you can select uh, that preference if that's helpful for you. Great. Um, okay, so now, um, so happy to, to kick off and, and welcome uh, Pamela. So in addition to serving as editor of the New York Times Book Review, Pamela Paul oversees book coverage at the Times where she hosts the weekly book review podcast. Her previous books include My Life with Bob, How to Raise a Reader and Rectangle Time, which is a book for children. Thank you. Uh, welcome, Pamela. Thanks for having me. Glad to be here. Now, Pamela, we're gonna, we're gonna, we got time to talk, but I, I just wanna note, like we were waiting for this call to begin. We had people joining from across the world and while people while we're waiting, we see people in the in the in, in the Zoom chat sharing all their cities that they're from, all across the world. Um, and it's one of those moments that's it's kind of I do I'm on Zoom calls every day, but at the same time, it's quite sobering uh, that there's like this sense of connection. Uh, and at the same time, there's this this constant conflict that we seem to be feeling of something also isn't quite right. But I kind of wanted to start off riffing off of that. Um, we're going to get into again what what you're writing and what you're what you're what, what you're especially focused on. But I'm 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 curious. Am I am I crazy for feeling that special feeling of like that sense of connection? Or how do you how do you process that? No, I mean I think it's great. I was looking people from South Africa and Melbourne and Ireland and Bath and at least two cities in Ohio. It's just incredible to have all these people join in and um, and that's one of the positive things about the internet and. One of the things I wanted to avoid in this book um, is, you know, saying it's all terrible or it's all great. You know, everything uh, tends to be extreme and polarized, and I think it's complicated, right? I mean, it's it's very positive that we can all be in this one shared virtual space at a given moment in time, um, and I, I think it's important to acknowledge those positive aspects of the internet. Just think about, for example, what it would have been like during lockdown without the internet. It, it would have been a complete disaster, not just in terms of not being able to connect on a daily basis with loved ones and friends, um, but also being able to do important things like attend memorials and funerals virtually and being able to work remotely if that was an option for you and continue to earn a paycheck every week. So I think it's important to put all of it in perspective. And when I was looking at the things that we lost to the internet, I try to, as much as possible, and it's hard, uh, to get out of my own um, way of seeing things and think, okay, well, I see, for example, um, e-readers as kind of a bummer. Um, I'm a book person, as you can see, I'm meaning a real book person from my bookshelves behind me. On the other hand, for kids with reading difficulties or uh, you know, learning disabilities, um, for adults who need to zoom into a much larger typeface because of eyesight issues, 
reading on a tablet is, is an incredible thing. Um, so I think that it's important to kind of think about these things from varying perspectives. And sometimes, you know, something that I decry on the internet at one given moment might at another point in my life actually be more positive. Yeah, I think what I'm hearing is this is complex. There's, there's a lot of things to balance and we, we're not in a place to make these sweeping statements that the internet and technology is our pathway to our utopian future, nor do we need to revert to something, you know, some given thing. It, so I, 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 I wonder what that channel is to finding what is that, that, right, that right balance and that responsible balance that works for, for us. Is there a universal way of finding that or is it, is it a person's discovery or, or how, what, is that, what is that journey for finding that? I mean, I do think it's up to the individual. I think that there are some general guidelines that one can bear in mind. Um, and what I was really trying to do in the book is to not so much describe like the problem or the situation, which I think we're all aware of. We all know how much we use the internet for good and for ill, but actually to take a moment and rather than think about the here and now or what we're more often even thinking about, which is what's next? What's tomorrow? What's in five minutes? What do I have to do? What app do I need? What do I need to learn? Why have I not heard about this? Actually to just go backwards for a moment and say, wait a minute, <laughs> what did we do before all of this? So much of the internet is about habit. And one thing we know about human beings is we're really good at forming habits. We do it very quickly and easily. I think even again, thinking about life under quarantine, if you are working remotely and you're meeting like this in a virtual sphere and, and, and conducting your business that way, it'll be really weird and hard to go back to regular meetings. So it'll be like, wait a minute, <laughs> what is it that we all do when we're in the room together? How did we talk amongst ourselves um, without everyone in the room hearing? Well, of course we didn't, but we've all developed this you know, ability to, um, or this habit really of, of, of slacking and texting while we're doing, while we're in a meeting like this, you know, even just chatting in a, in a, in a chat space. It'll, we'll have to kind of unlearn all of that in a way once we get back to uh, back to the real world. So I wanted to break us out of thinking about the habits that we've sunk into and really think about what did we do before all of this? It's, it's hard to remember. It's hard to remember, for example, if you were running late to a dinner party and you were driving, like, what, what, what do we do? <laughs> How did we tell the person that we were, you know, that we the host, I'm late, I'm, I'm, I'm caught in traffic, there's an accident. Um, how did they know uh, that there was a major traffic incident um, on the street approaching their home? They didn't. But it's again, it's very hard to remember because it feels like a long time ago, even though these habits, these internet habits that we've built up, these conventions are only 20 years old. I love that. It sounds like through storytelling, we can kind of, uh, kind of, or uh, reflections of the past that prompts us to, to reassess what, how are we living today? We don't, yeah. we don't, yeah, that, 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 that's, 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 that's beautiful. Um, it's kind of a, a documenting, right? It's like a, a very near history of what we have forgotten in many senses or nearly forgotten. Would you mind, um, just if you, if you want to just share, like, I don't know, the basic premise of the book, and I'm, I'm curious of, not simply what inspired you to write it, but was there a certain give point? Was there a certain action or, or thing that you saw in the world that was like, okay, this is it. I need, I need to spend a year. I need to spend some time really of my life um, focused on, on this. I wish it were just a year. <laughs> I was working out for quite a while, but um, so the, the premise of the book, it's a hundred things we've lost to the internet. They're things that are gone or as good as gone because they're so radically changed that they're almost unrecognizable from the before times. And it might be something like a physical object, um, like you know a file cabinet or a staple remover, all those like tchotchkes we used to keep on our desktop, or it might be something interpersonal like blind dates, like you don't go on a blind date anymore. You Google the hell out of someone before you meet them. And then you decide whether you're even going to go on the blind date. But either way, when you get there, it's not blind. You've seen a million pictures of this person. Um, or whether it's something ineffable like empathy um, or social cues. And I wanted to sort of dip back into that time to remember, or that thing, remember what it was. And sometimes it's a physical object 
Um, but there are also larger aspects of it. And this is how I got to 100, because of course I started like with 281. So just take one example, the Rolodex. So the Rolodex, for those of us who were around, you remember it was that big hunk of black plastic um, sometimes it was a long rectangle, but other times it was a spinning thing that would be on someone's desk and it would have business cards, um, which we still create for some reason, although most people just, you know, um, scan them um, and keep them virtually at this point or, or you know, use a, a contact system um, online or on the cloud somewhere. Um, but back in the day, you used to go into someone's office, especially the office of someone powerful and connected, and there would be at least one big Rolodex on their desk. And so that's an object. It's really not in use very much anymore, but it also conveyed this idea of power and connection and this concept of you are who you know, um, because it was really powerful to be able to get in touch with just someone really important, whether it was the head of a movie studio or a major sales manager or someone famous. Um, and if you had all of those contacts that said something about you. Now, of course, we all know everyone, anyone can follow anyone, anyone can DM anyone. You're probably, you know, we're all six degrees of Kevin Bacon. We're probably all like two degrees of Kevin Bacon. You go onto LinkedIn and you can see just how many people separate you from like anyone else on the planet. And so it no longer is about who you are, that you are, who you know, that whole concept is lost um, and has kind of fundamentally changed. And even knowing someone, right, that, that very basic thing has changed. Um, so I'll give you an example from, from my daily work, which is I work at the book review. And when we decide to assign a book to a potential reviewer, we want to suss out any conflicts of interest. This person shouldn't know that person. So we ask, do you know this person? Do you have any conflicts of interest? And it used to be pretty straightforward. It was like, no, I've never met that person. But now it's more complicated. It's like, oh, well, I'm, I'm, I'm Facebook friends with the person, but we've never actually met. Or that person asked me to link in with me, but I said no. Or um, we once had a DM on Twitter, but we've never actually spoken. So it's a lot more complex and, and, and you can know someone electronically for 15 years before ever meeting them face to face. The impetus to the book, it started off actually with one essay, an op-ed that I wrote for the New York Times and it was about boredom. And the headline um, for the article in the Times was let children be bored again or get bored again. And the working title in my mind as I was writing it was The Lost Art of Boredom with that double entendre, you know, deliberate because of course what we lose in boredom is a certain art, right? Like the time to create. If you are constantly getting input, you can't, you're just processing that input. It's hard to pause to then generate output. Um, and you, you have to cease getting information and entertainment and things coming in, in order to create something out of nowhere. And I thought about this actually, as I was walking to the train station on my way to work one day, uh, because even though it's like a 12 minute walk, and in the olden days, I might just stare at the trees. I started thinking to myself, I'm not using this time. I'm not using this time at all. I could use this time, meaning I could text and walk, which is dangerous, but I do it all the time. Or I could listen to a podcast. Or I could catch up on an audio book. I could do so many things with this extra 12 minutes. And I did start realizing you lose something there, right? There's a reason why we all have our big ideas in the shower. It's because that's maybe one of the few times where we don't have access to the internet. Yeah, that's a powerful message. I think it, we, um, time is, seems to be something that uh, we either think of time as money um, or, uh, um, and, and, and we, in, in the sense of waste, this wasting time, every, every moment is scarce, but that's not the only way of thinking about things. And it's easy to get caught up with that. I'm, we think of time often now as something to optimize. Yeah. I'm getting hung up though with, when, we, when you talk about examples of the Rolodex but, and, and, and kind of, I, I love how you emphasized what, what that, uh, the messaging that came through that technology or that tool, but that was a technology and a tool in of itself. And there was something that, you know, precursed that. I, I think um, 
your book, the book is very timely for the year 2022, but people have been squeamish towards technology through history. I think of like Neil Postman's Amusing Ourselves to Death, what was like 1985, that was a commentary on uh, society dependent on entertainment. Um, but, but even Plato spoke of Socrates talking down on technology of the written word, you, writing that uh, writing will create forgetfulness in the learner's souls because they will not use their memories. And, and so this is this long standing thing. And I, I, where, where does this, how, how, is it always, is it always going back or, or how, how do you, how do you approach that? Yeah, I mean, look, people are afraid of change. They're nervous about change. And every time, you're right, every time a new technology has been introduced, there's been a concern that it would drive people apart somehow. I mean, there was a worry about the radio, that the radio would drive people apart, that we would all become isolated in our homes listening to the radio and not have to connect in a more concrete, in-person way. So that has existed for a long time. And, and you made me think this is a little bit peripheral, but of a really wonderful short story by Ted Chang um, called The Truth of Fact, The Truth of Feeling. And it's really about the, um, the technologies of, um, of writing um, and, um, and then an invented technology in the story, which I, again, hugely recommend. It's our two, um, two narratives that, uh, that, that weave together. You go back and forth between the two of them. In one narrative, there is a technology that's been introduced called, I think, Rememberum, um, although I don't remember exactly because one thing we've lost is our memory. Um, and it's like a, a little inserted device in the brain and it records every single thing that the person experiences or here. So it's a little bit like an episode of Black Mirror. I think there was something very similar. So for example, if you get into an argument with your spouse and you said, well, you told me back at the time that you didn't want to go to this dinner, you know, the person can then scroll back and, you know, and, and, and play it back and say, oh, you know, actually I'm wrong or whatever, you're wrong more likely. Um, and, and remember that. And the, the story that it, that it uh, we used together with is with um, in an unnamed African country where disputes are resolved orally by a kind of mediator and someone introduces um, the idea of writing. And so now you can resolve disputes supposedly more um, effectively and more accurately because things can be written down. And so you can keep track of problems that occur and get you know varying witnesses uh, testimony. And in both these instances, the idea is that this is going to resolve um, problems of differing interpretation. And of course, in both of these circumstances, that's not the case um, because just you know, creating a new kind of technology does not always necessarily improve the way in which we communicate, and it doesn't necessarily even improve the art, the act of remembering. And so there's that title, the truth of fact, the truth of feeling. Sometimes what we believe to be true is not necessarily what we know to be true or think to be true and vice versa. It's hard to reconcile these things. And I think that a lot of that happens on the internet. You know, the internet is supposed to be about communication and connection. And yet uh, I think anyone who uses the internet at all, which is to say all of us knows that it does not necessarily facilitate either of those things all of the time. And in fact, sometimes does quite the opposite. Hmm. It sounds like it's well, you're more than just expressing sentiment for the past. It seems like you're really seeing a pattern of change that we frame as progress but doesn't quite seem right. Would you share more on that? And, and how did we get here to this notion of, of, of constant progress and this trust in progress? Well, you know, I think in terms of technology, right? When you think about technology, really um, every development, technologically speaking, is a new product, a new service, a new software. Um, and it's, you know, it, it's something that we can decide whether or not we want to adopt. It's sold to us very heavily. And the idea is that if you sort of exert any conscious decision making into like, hmm, do I actually need that? Do I want that? Do I have to do that? Uh, there's a label that's left on you, which is that, oh, you're a Luddite or you're, you know, afraid of change or you're not, you know, 
this is not 21st century thinking. Um, whereas in reality, it's like any product that might be introduced in 2022. Look, in 2022, I'm sure there are many new designs of bed sheets and many new uh, colors of, you know, and patterns of sweaters. But that doesn't make, you know, we don't have to think about it in terms of like, if I don't buy that thing, <laughs> um, it doesn't mean that I'm not a 21st century person. It just means that I have made a choice. Um, and I think we sometimes conflate the idea of new products and services with progress. It's not always progress. I mean, in fact, if you're talking about something physical like new sweaters, there's a lot of ways in which it's not progress. Maybe a new, less expensive, you know, sweater was created by people under, you know, terrible labor conditions, and that's why it's so inexpensive. Um, so, or maybe it's, you know, created all the way across the world, and so it requires huge costs in terms of shipping um, to the environment. So, you know, I think that we need to disentangle the idea of technological change necessarily being equivalent to progress. And then also that progress is necessarily to the good because there's a lot of things that are progressing, like climate change is progressing, but it doesn't mean it's getting better. Yeah, I, I, I love this point so much. I, I used to, this is, I'm um, I, I used to work in a digital literacy organization. So I'd be training older folks or people out of prison how to use computers. And I had to tell them up front, you're okay, you're not wrong because you don't know how to consume a piece of this piece of software that was written by some person in some room. Like this is not holy, you know, like code. You know, it, it, it's just a tool that someone's scraped up and our world has decided to appropriate it as normal. Um, yeah. And, you know, it's interesting because you, you mentioned these two populations, older populations and, and, and incarcerated people. And in both those cases, um, those are two of the populations that I most often get handwritten letters mm -hmm. to, you know, from uh, at the book review. And often they're the best letters. Um, so, again, there's something lost when you stop handwriting letters and say send, sending emails instead. Mm. Um, kind of like a pivoting a little bit. It, I'm curious your thoughts on younger generations. I know uh, Gen Z folks grew up with social media, but it seems like they're they're more nostalgic than other generations. Um, is there some sort of connection here, or how do you, how do you make sense of that? Uh, between, sorry, Gen Xers and uh, or yeah, Gen Z, the the younger younger generation. oh the younger generations. Yeah. Well, I think you know when you talk about digital natives, right? They don't have any recollection of many of the things that I'm writing about in this book. They don't have any direct experience of it. Um, and every you know, it's funny. We always think of of sort of young people as constantly on the forefront of change. Um, but in fact, if you think back to your own teenage years, like there's a lot of nostalgia among teenagers. When I was a teenager um, in the 80s, for example, the 80s weren't the cool thing. Um, the 50s and the 60s were the cool thing. Um, and, you know, and, and people were really interested in old film and, you know, um, the sort of era of, of, of the great film stars and people watched, you know, Ingmar Bergman films and, and like all of that was very cool. And to that, in that regard, I think for today's Gen Z, uh, what's really cool is the 80s and the 90s. And as they're exploring, even sort of suit less uh, or I don't want to say superficial, but let's just, I'm going to say superficial because I can't find a better word right now. Things like fashion, um, they also start seeing other aspects of the culture. It's like the TV show Stranger Things, you know, where you kind of immerse yourself in, oh my gosh, you know, you used to have to go to say a mall um, to see people. Like you couldn't just all be in a group chat um, or snapping at each other from home. So I do think that there is, when they, when they immerse themselves in this culture, they see there's a kind of simplicity to it. And I think one thing we know about digital natives and this current generation is that there are high levels of stress and anxiety. And we know now um, because there have been some whistleblowers that a lot of that has come out of social media. And I think that they can tell like, gosh, it was a little bit easier um, when uh, the, you know, when, when people talked about you, if they talked behind your back, it was maybe like one person in a group of five people, you know, and then maybe it would spread a little bit from there, but it wasn't in what is essentially a public forum like social media, where it was extending well beyond your, you know, sphere of contacts into this huge world. And I think of, you know, incidents like there was this, there was this guy who I think worked at Target and he became a meme and he became hugely famous. And years later, you know, he expressed 
a lot of, even though like he was very popular, people liked him, it became really complicated to become this sort of known thing, even though it was just an image of him and nobody really knew who he was as a person. And I think about things like, if you think back to when you were a teenager and let's say something like silly and embarrassing happened to you, like you walked out of the bathroom and there's a bit of toilet paper stuck to the bottom of your foot, like, and you went down the hallway and it wasn't until like you got to math that like a friend of yours was like, hey, you know, you want to take that off. And now you could have like seven people videoing you know, like screenshotting you and, 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 and recording you and then post turning it into a meme and posting it on social media. And like, and suddenly it's just so much bigger than it ever was like this little teeny embarrassing thing that would have been gone in five minutes now can be online. And you might say, well, you know, in three minutes, something new will come online and take people's attention from that. But the other thing about the internet is that it stays there. So it could, people could stop paying attention to it and then it could resurface three years later. Like, hey, remember this thing? You know, it's, it's funny. Like I think of even things that are amusing and I think basically harmless, like BBC man. Remember BBC man who like uh, was online. He was uh, talking on some British news oh, program. Yeah, yeah. And his kids came in the background and his wife came in into panic and it was so funny. I mean, I, I watched that like 17 times and then I, my kids all watched it. And then, you know, we kind of forgot about it. And then one of my kids was like, remember BBC man, can we watch that again? So like for that guy, you know, that's there forever. But then think about like 10, 15 years from now and his kids are teenagers. And now like they are the, they are teenagers in the full throttle of self-consciousness. And like, there's a permanent funny video of them online you know, and, 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 and at least in the, in the United States, there isn't a right to be forgotten. You can't be like, you know what, like I was a toddler. I kind of want that little picture of me in my little like exercise thing to be gone, but you know, no, it's there. It's interesting because it, it's so counterintuitive. Earlier you said how uh, people might find these times in the past or Gen Z might find people's times in the past as simpler times or easier times, but all the promotion and development of, of these of these consumer technology services are for simplicity and ease. You know, we're here to make your life simpler. So it, it, it that that, you're, that kind of implies that the framework, the framing that people that we use to decide what people need, something's not right there. Yeah. Well, you know, it, it, yes, certain things do make things simpler and easier and sometimes more efficient. But again, if even if you just think about the idea of like efficiency, I am really efficient online. I can toggle like seven windows at once and respond to, you know, a million notifications and texts, and that's highly efficient. Now, at the end of the day, did that make my life like really easier? Not really. Um, one of the things I think about too is that we're having so many interactions in a given day and we can make them, you know, come and go quickly and we can, um, you know, sort of, uh, it's kind of like a game of whack-a-mole. There's an illustration in my book of, um, on the chapter about lost productivity, which I think is something that we've all lost, um, where it's, you know, someone playing whack-a-mole and, and that is like what our days feel like where you're, you're very efficient. You can deal with a million and one messages. The other thing though, that, that, that isn't captured in that is that there's a lot of information in those messages and all that information is coming in. And the other thing that's coming in is emotional engagement, right? Like there's a lot of things that happen to, not just to us and happen at us in a way, but also things happening to other people that we are learning about in a given day. That's a lot for a human being mm -hmm. to, metabolize in a given day. So, you know, if you think about like, even, I mean, you could go back to like the middle ages and there's always an anecdote about how much information someone observed and absorbed in a full year in the middle ages compared to like one day of reading the New York times. But if you think about that in terms of emotional engagements, like let's think back to say the Jane Austen era, and you might get a really upsetting letter from someone and maybe someone in a, you know, in a sitting room said something terrible to you and maybe someone said something that made something that made you laugh so that's like three kind of emotional things that that night you know in austin era england you're trying to go to bed and you're thinking about those three things 
um, that maybe kind of took up your emotional energy that day. But of course, in a regular day with the internet, you are absorbing like deaths of people's family members that you peripherally saw on Facebook, um, really nasty tweets that you absorbed out of the corner of your eye, some of them to you, some of them to people you know, some of them to people you work with, and some of, you know, some of it is really uh, disturbing. Um, some of it is devastating. Um, and there's just a whole bigger world of emotional engagement that we're all involved in. And I think that's one of the reasons why it's so hard to go to sleep at night, because human beings haven't really evolved, like it's just as physical beings in our minds to take on that much emotional, like I, I don't know what the word is, emotional information, emotional engagement, like provocation in one day. And you can find 30 or 40 things to obsess about or be upset about or worry about just from a single day of online interactions. I think you're making an important case for really reevaluating our, our our habits and our norms and, and sense of dependence, but it, it it seems like it's far from an easy task. Um, so I, I you know you, how, how do we begin? It's, <laughs> I'm like afraid of saying that because it's such a loaded question. But what 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 are what are some things either that you've practiced yourself or that you've shared with others or you've seen be effective? So I thought about this a lot and sorry for shifting around. There's suddenly like a sunset basically in my face. <laughs> I'm trying to avoid it here. Um, so for those of you who like for on the other side of the world where it, it's nighttime, um, it is basically the sun is going down right here in my space. Um, so some of the things I think about it are um, getting back to that idea that when we think about new technology or technologies that we currently use to think about them the same way we do um, about any product or service, right? Like we like to think of ourselves, most of us, as skeptical, discerning consumers, right? As people who are like, no, I am not going to go back to low waist jeans. I bought into the high waist jeans thing again, and now I'm not going back to low waist just because you're telling me that this is the new fashion this year. And yet we don't apply that same level of skepticism to new technologies, whether it's an app or game or a, uh, a communication platform or uh, a new website or an update to your operating system, we don't say to ourselves like, oh, this is a choice I can make. Do I want this thing or do I not want this thing? So I think that's one thing, just taking the mindset of like, you don't have to automatically update to everything. You don't have to automatically get everything. All of these things are products and services that are being sold to us. And that, you know, that the fact that it's a consumer interaction, I think, is somewhat hidden because they're often free. However, I think that we've all gotten to a stage in our awareness of the internet to know that none of this is free. There's a cost to everything. It might be a societal cost. It might be an environmental cost. It might be a competition cost. It might be a cost to the downtown of the community in which we live. It might be a cost to other people we know, uh, but there's always a cost. And it might just be a personal cost to us, like, oh, a loss of time. It costs me time to do this new thing. Maybe I wanna keep that time. So that's, I think, a general mindset shift. Um, and then, you know, very specifically, a few more ideas. One is to think about when you're debating whether to get something or not, not um, do I want this thing, do I need this thing, but am I actually happy with what I'm using now? Am I okay with what I'm using now? If you are okay with what you have now, do you necessarily need to get the new thing? So in my life, for example, one decision I've made is, I'm not going to do Venmo or Zelly or I don't know. There's another, there's another one in Europe. I'm forgetting the name that I don't do. So a friend of mine over there asked me and I'm like, no, I don't, I don't know what this thing is. I am just going to write checks. Or if like, if we go out to dinner rather than split the bill um, using some kind of funds transfer, I have made the decision like, I'll treat you this time and then you can treat me the next time. That's actually nicer than you're also creating an opportunity where you're creating that, you know, being generous to someone in the moment and then offering the expectation that there'll be a next time. So that's one way to, to think about things. Like, do I, not necessarily do I want to upgrade to this thing, but am I okay with what I have now? And if I'm okay, I don't even really need to think about, you know, to, to think about this decision. You know, and again, I go back to the idea over betting or something like that. I don't know, are my sheets fine? 
yes, they're fine. So I recognize that there are like 10 new patterns of sheets that are available on this website I really like, but I'm actually okay with the sheets I have. Mm -hmm. I can give more examples. <laughs> I, I might ask that, but I, I, I think that's just so often in these conversations, we think of, okay, what can we strip away? Which mm -hmm. is maybe there's a time for that, but what you're prompting is, is um, rather than stripping away, think about first of what you, what you adopt. Um, yes. I, I, I want to, I want to share an example. I, I, in like 2011, I, I got off Facebook. I closed my Facebook account. I was at a prime age where I, I was looking for things to do. I, I know it's a fact. I did not get invited to as many cool parties and events because I wasn't on the list, you know, of things to invite. And that, that impacted me. Um, today I'm back on Facebook, but I just don't have the app. So it's like really like I, 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 I restarted, but I, I started with, um, better intention. And so I, I have to manually on my phone, I'll type in facebook.com. And it's a really like annoying web interface, you know, but the, the, there's, it doesn't always mean just stripping away. Um, yes. Right. I mean, th there are lots of ways in which you can control your internet. Like you can control, for example, you can turn off location services. Um, and that means that maybe the entire world is not following your every motion and movement um, in space, which I don't know, for some people, it's kind of nice to think, oh, I am not being tracked. And of course, you lose some things. It means that when you turn on the weather app, you know, it doesn't automatically show you the weather where you are. And you might have to actually type in the name names uh, of, the, of, the, of the town that you're, you're currently in. But again, like these are all ways, these are, these are all choices that we can make. And I think that idea of choice and reclaiming those choices as our own is important and not succumbing to the pressure of the dominant marketing message, which is what it is, marketing message that, oh, you're going to get left behind if you don't do this, or you're not mm -hmm. with it, or you're missing out. Like the other thing to think about with regard to missing out is, it's kind of nice to miss out, right? Like you don't need to know about every single thing. Um, it's kind of nice to say, I see people arguing about something on Twitter or on Facebook or posting some bit of news. And I actually don't have to look at that. I can choose not to be part of that particular conversation and not to get all riled up or not to jump in and not to have my say. Um, and, you know, look, I say all of this, I'm not trying to sound very judgmental because I can easily succumb to all of this. Sometimes I'm like, my kids are so cute and they said such a funny thing and I could just like post about it and then have lots of people give me happy feedback. And then I pause and I say like, but wait a minute, like, do I have to, or, you know, I'm always tempted to, to, to post about the candy that I've eaten. Like, but why, you know, like why it does it really matter. Does it really, you know, do people really care? Do they need to know? Um, so I think it is about, as you said, being more intentional about these kinds of choices. And the other thing that I think you can do that again, as a way of kind of seizing control is compartmentalized. And that's a word that kind of has a, a bad uh, reputation because people think about it in psychological terms like oh you just compartmentalize something bad and put it on a shelf but you can compartmentalize your technological life so for me um, as a journalist at the New York Times I have to be completely on top of technology if I weren't I wouldn't be doing my job but that means that in my personal life I can say okay well that's at work and I use that at work but I am not going to use these things at home or when I log off from work I'm going to sort of shut down these other aspects of the technology that I'm using and choose to do these things in another way. Um, a lot of these things, I'm, we've been talking about how they're, it seems like they're good for ultimate betterment, but I, and, I'm, and I'm curious how this connects to happiness. Um, I, I, I can tell you again, I, I, I'm proud to be someone who has a Facebook account, but I don't get bummed out by Facebook and I found a way it, do, have you seen a correlation or connection or have you heard stories of, of are, are these things uh, that can ultimately kind of bring joy, especially in these turbulent times? You know, I, I think it's very hard to prove causation. Like there, there are a lot of studies that would show correlation with certain online habits and happiness. Um, and I do think it's individual. I think, um, you know, I, for example, for me, um, I have realized that I would rather with a really good friend, I would rather see them on person than enjoy them in any other technology. Like I'd rather see them in person once a year 
in many cases for a really good, like a long weekend together, or even just like a very long dinner than to have 30 emails or, you know, group chats. Like, and so I make that very, that, that decision, like this is much more rewarding to me. I'm going to choose to limit the interaction to this. Mm -hmm. Um, But again, that's just me. And for other people, like one of the great things about the internet is to like have constantly, you know, constant access to someone. Um, And there is a lot of, of, of positive to that. And I, I, I'll give another example of sort of what I was talking about earlier to try to think about this in terms of you know, a lot of it is about the individual and perspective. One of the lost things, one of the chapters in the book is about being the only one. And so being the only one can sound lonely and awful. Um, It depends on the situation. It can also be special and great. Um, And it also can be a good thing not to be the only one and it can be a bad thing. So I'll uh, give an example. Like if you, for example, pride yourself on, um, I don't know, your baking of shortbread and you just think like, I bake the best shortbread. I've been doing it for 10 years. I have come up with the greatest recipes and my cookies are really cute. And you take a bunch of pictures of it and then you go online and you look and you, you realize like, oh, I'm not the only one who created these spectacular shortbread cookie designs. There are lots of people who make these their own designs and they've been doing it for longer and better. Their shortbread cookies look like they even taste better than mine. And in fact, I'm just like, I'm not even that good compared to everyone else online. So you're no longer the only one who makes what you thought were these super original shortbread cookies. And that can sort of feel bad. On the other hand, if you are, say, the parent of a child who's born with a rare genetic disorder and you feel like you're the only one, um, you can very easily connect with other parents who are in that exact same situation and exchange you know, therapies and remedies and information and just lean on each other and vent. And that is a great thing. Um, If you feel isolated from your physical geographic community and you feel like I'm the only one in my town who, you know, is into theater or um, is questioning their identity or whatever it might be, you can find a different community online. And again, that makes it, that turns it into a positive. So I do think, you know, when you think about um, these lost things, it, it really depends on the person. And sometimes it's the same person and it just it depends on the moment or the forum. Sometimes being the only one is good and sometimes it's bad. And sometimes the internet can help with either of those things. Well, shameless plug, I, I just think that like uh, a lot of what I'm hearing is this is more, it's less, less of a rule book, rule book and more of a finding what works. And I think Pamela's book may be a great way to kind of ruminate and reflect in, in, on, on, that, on that for each of us. Um, we're, gonna, we're gonna move on to Q&A in a moment, but I, I have one question um, I wanna ask last um, and uh, it's a little bit selfish. We've been talking about consumer technology a lot in the context of 2022, um, but, um, I mean, let's be real, like we're, the smartphone has kind of maxed out. Uh, all these companies are coming under scrutiny and antitrust probes, um, and they're all rushing to new modes of technology, uh, whether this be this crypto or Web3 or virtual reality and all this stuff. So what do you, what do you think is next in, um, with, with, with the internet and whatnot? And, and how, how, how are you kind of already finding your mindset to, to navigate that, all this newness that we're less familiar with. You know, I, 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 I'm going to give you an honest, but maybe unsatisfying answer, which is I don't try to predict the world. <laughs> I think that any time I've attempted to do that, um, you know, I, I tend to be wrong. I think like even just as temperamentally as a journalist, you try not to think about like what what's going to happen. Um, it often gets us into trouble. I try to think about really just processing what just happened. Um, and off also as a, as a former history major, it's like, well, what happened 20 years ago or 100 years ago? And what does that mean for now? So my mindset tends to operate um, in the opposite direction. But what I think is useful about that, that, that way of thinking is that it's always provides you a useful contrast, right? So again, I get back to that idea of like, whatever it is that does happen, I'm going to l- look at the present and the past is benchmarks to kind of judge, like, is this something I want to participate in? Is this a good thing? What do I think of this? Um, but I, uh, I, I am definitely not a futurist. I think I'm probably a pastist more than more than 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 a futurist. Well, yeah, th- thank you. I, I think they're gonna. It sounds like it feels like it's gonna bring on 
uh, new questions, then maybe that's the next the next journey or the next the next book. Um, okay, we got some we have some questions from from some folks. Um, so we'll move over to there. Um, Justin, Justin shared, uh, we have never been more connected, but never so disconnected. Thoughts, thoughts on this? Yeah, I mean, one of the things that I, one of the lost things, one of the chapters is called solitude, um, because I think it's really hard to feel solitude. And I'm going to think about it for a moment in a positive light. Solitude can be really useful. Solitude um, can be good. It can be good to just sit with yourself and to just be alone. And I think that's hard to recoup. That's hard to capture, and it's hard to recuperate because it's no longer a kind of resting state, right? It's no longer, for example, if you go somewhere by yourself that you're then alone. That's not that. That is not the baseline because the baseline is you have your phone or portable internet. So the baseline is you can connect with anyone else. You'd have to very consciously decide either not to bring your phone at all um, or to keep it turned off the entire time. But the baseline is no longer that assumption that like when I go off into the woods, I am alone. You're not alone. And when and and to capture that solitude, it requires like a very conscious mind shift because in fact you have hundreds thousands of people knocking at your door at that very moment the door is just on your phone or on the internet they're sending you notifications they're sending updates they are posting things there are headlines there are alerts so they're all there and you're not alone you have to very deliberately decide i'm going to keep them out and for my own life um an example I think back to is after college, I decided I needed to be alone, um, that I needed to kind of get away from everything that I had been surrounded by my entire life, all the people. College is obviously a very social experience. And I decided that I would buy a one-way ticket uh, to Northern Thailand and move there, even though I didn't know anyone there and I didn't speak the language and I had no connections and I had no job. And it was really hard. It was pre-internet. I didn't even have, I didn't have a cell phone. I didn't even have a landline. My neighbor had a landline. And if I wanted to be reached, um, someone would have to write me a letter and say, I'm gonna call at this time. <laughs> and I would then go over to my neighbor's house and wait for them to call. So I had like a standing arrangement with my parents, for example, to call every two weeks, but long distance was of course expensive. So it would be like a three minute conversation. And that solitude was really hard, um, but also hugely rewarding. I was challenging in a good way. Um, it forced me to think about things. And what, what I find, you know, um, sad, honestly, is that it's impossible to recapture that experience because if you did that, you would have to go there knowing like there's the internet is everywhere. You could walk into any place and get online, even if you didn't bring your phone. Um, so it's just an altogether different experience. We are more connected to get back to um, the comment, but um, it can also feel very lonely, right? It can feel really lonely if you post something that you think is absolutely juicy and wonderful and original and witty, and then like three people like it. You're like, really? <laughs> you like So it sort of feels like you're connected and yet you notice that an absence of connection all the more so. We have lots of good questions coming in here. Um, Kind of riffing off of this, this might be similar, but um, Alex says, um, could you please remind me some of the things that we have lost? I, I heard a therapist saying that it is more beneficial emotionally to write by hand than to type. Are there other suggestions or other practical ideas that are similar to, to the example he gave of writing by hand? Oh, I want to actually talk more about writing by hand. I love that example. Actually, one related thing that we've lost is penmanship. Like, um, I don't know about you, but I find if I have to take notes, um, by hand, not not keyboarding um, or typing as I was it was once called. Um, my handwriting is dreadful, but also I can't even write as quickly or as legibly as I used to be able to do. I used to sometimes take you know handwritten notes when I was doing an interview um, as a as a reporter. Um, and uh, now if I do that, I just I lose everything. I can't keep up. Um, but it is absolutely true that people absorb, and retain information better 
when they write it down. And this is something that we've lost and something that I think college professors and students, maybe to a less de lesser degree, notice profoundly. People don't know how to take notes anymore. Even the idea of taking notes in a lecture is it's a skill that you learn. Like, I don't know um, if any of you who are maybe older than 40 remember, but when you would take notes in class, you develop all these systems, like your little bullet points and your arrows and your asterisks and your stars. And it was a way to organize your thinking. Um, and our brains, especially for those of us who are visually oriented, um, often create memories based on where things are located on a page where you have a sensory memory of writing something down um, and all of that uh, all of that is is lost and it's a shame too when you think about you know the ways in which um, kids learn from a really early age now I mean iPads are introduced to in many places in, in kindergarten with a one-to-one -one program um, or tablets of some kind where kids are never really learning to handwrite never mind cursive cursive is another thing that's just gone. Um, but uh, they are never learning to have to process information in that way. And when you think about the fact that they're getting so much more information than we are get, than we got when we were that age, and they have fewer tools with which to absorb it, you can really kind of recognize the, the, the larger repercussions of that loss. Thank you. Um, one from Samuel. He says, what's your take on cell phone addiction? He says, I stay up to 6 a.m. to interact in messenger groups. Where does online need for socialization become a problem or nuisance? So, you know, addiction is a tricky word and I'm not a psychologist and I don't, um, you know, the DSM, uh, the Diagnostic Manual for um, Disorders has all kinds of rules about what's an addiction and what's a compulsion and what's a habit and I can't really say uh, with any authority what's an addiction but I do think that people recognize addictive or compulsive or bad habits um, behaviors uh, with the internet um, and interfering with sleep. If you look at, for example, questionnaires about any other form of addiction, whether it's gambling or, you know, recognized addictions or um, alcohol abuse, and you have questionnaires, um, interfering with sleep is definitely uh, on many of those questionnaires in terms of like, is this becoming a problem or not? Um, and one thing that I always recommend, and again, you know, it's up to the individual, but I don't sleep with my phone. <laughs> I know that seems radical, uh, but I have an old fashioned alarm clock. It operates with a battery. Actually, the battery is running out right now. You do too. Yeah. It's really reliable. And, um, and, um, and, and with my phone outside the room, there have been a number of studies that show when your phone is out of the room, when it's out of sight, that you enjoy what you're doing more, you sleep better. Um, they, they've done studies actually, at the, this is in the book where people have a meal. They've done a, a, a study where they have a control group that does a, has a meal with the phone on the table and a study with one where the meal, where the phone is out of sight. And afterwards they're asked all kinds of questions. They don't know that this is a questionnaire, that this is a study about technology. And the people who did not have their phone visible actually enjoyed the meal more, like the food tasted better. I, 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 I remember a study, the, the professor had the students go to a, a gallery and some students got to bring cameras and some didn't bring cameras. And then the, she tested retention afterwards. And when there's some sort of camera, you know, even if you, whether even you're taking photos or not, just the, having the camera in your hand, it impacts yes. the way you process the information and how you retain it. Yes, yes, there's that student Susan Sontag on photography essay. And I and I and I I've thought about that a lot actually in my 20s after living abroad in Thailand. I then did a lot of traveling and lived abroad a few other times. And um, I would often make a deliberate decision. This is like before the internet, obviously. I'm not gonna bring a camera on this trip. You know, I was recently recently talking about this great trip I took to Bolivia with, and I was talking about it with one of my kids, and I realized, oh, I don't have a photo of the silver mines of Potosi. I don't have a photo of the most dangerous road in the world because I didn't bring a camera on that trip. I chose not to. Okay. Um, I, I think we'll, we'll close out with Stanley really asked just a really, I think a great question to kind of really open, you know, just final thoughts of sharing practical ways that we can unplug in this virtual world. 
Um, you know, I think that we, we, I talked about choice earlier, and I'm going to use another uh, word, another way of thinking about this, which is control. Like we, it often feels like we're out of control. Um, and you know, that, that, but you have to remember that you do have control. Um, you do have control and, you know, another way for parents that are out there, they often like lament how much their kids are on their phone how dependent their kids are on, on screens and, you know, one thing to remember, and again, of course, it's up to the individual parent, it depends on your kids and all of that, but um, you're the one who's in charge. Like if your child has a phone, chances are your child's not paying for the phone bills, um, even if they bought the phone themselves. So that, like, it's, that's your choice. It's your choice. You can limit the amount that your kids are on the phone. You don't have to get your kids a phone when everyone else is getting a phone. Um, you can remember again, like, <sighs> You know, you talked earlier about ease and simplicity, and there are lots of things that are convenient about having a phone. And I just want to remind everyone, I'm, when I use the word phone, I really mean the internet, because that's what the phone is. People don't use it to make phone calls, generally speaking. They use it for, for the internet. And one thing that people will say is, well, I got my child a phone because they're going to be walking to school, um, you know, back and forth by themselves. So they're going to be biking, or they're going to be on a city bus or a subway. You have to remember, um, for those of us who are around, we did all of that. We did all of that without carrying the internet and most of us are still here. And chances are, if the big bad wolf comes and tries to abduct your child or they're hit by a car, having the internet on them is not gonna help because the first thing an abductor is gonna do is throw that you know, phone into the woods or disable it. Um, if it's someone's hit by a car, they're not gonna be able to like crawl over you know, and, 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 and pick up the phone and call home. Um, so it, it, it's interesting a lot of those decisions, that's about reassuring us, right? It's about the parent actually needing the phone. And if you sort of reflect like, well, maybe I can let go of a little bit of that control. So it's about seizing control, but also being able to let go. Maybe I don't need to know where my child is all the time. Maybe I can try to live with having that outside of my control, outside of my immediate knowledge. My parents did it with us. Maybe I can do it with my child. So I think that's another word to kind of think carefully about control and where you want to hold on to it with regard to technology and where you want to be able to let go of it. Well, thank you, Pamela, so much for joining us for your time and for insights. This was this was really, really valuable for me and I hope for others who are listening in too. And thank you all to all the all attendees for joining today. Thank you so much. So, so just wrapping up, just a few things. Um, here you see on the on the screen, this is Pamela's book, 100 Things We've Lost to the Internet. Do a, do a, do a Google search, um, you know, fi find an online retailer or a local bookshop um, that, that you can pick this up from. Uh, I, I highly encourage. Um, for those who, 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 who share this interest, who, who, who are looking to, who aren't organizers today and, and are looking for an opportunity to really connect with other people, um, face to face, um, or 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 through kind of really focused online conversations and, and activities, um, you can you can save thirty percent off your first uh, subscription and starting your meetup group. Just you can go to meetupsavings.com. And and finally, we launched uh, the Keep Connected podcast um, last year with with David Siegel, uh, Meetup CEO. Um, if you want to hear more conversations about community and connection, um, you can scan this QR code, take out your phone, and or go to this website, uh, meet a podcast. Pamela, you make me feel like funny every time now I'm, I'm saying, pull out your phone and, and look up this thing. <laughs> that's, the, that's the reality um, at this moment. And, and, uh, but, but yeah, I, I encourage everyone, if, if you enjoy this conversation, I know you enjoy this podcast. Um, as a reminder, you, you can view and recap um, this event in a few days on the Community Matters blog. Uh, and there's other, other, other videos and other valuable information there, meetup.com slash blog. Um, so thank you again, everyone, uh, for joining us and, and stay safe. Bye-bye. Thank you so much, too.